Yeah. I like those those amen horns. That's good. <laughs> we are going to sing a bit. We're going to praise our Lord in song, and then our brother John's going to bring us a good lesson. So we're going to sing the first song on your song sheets, number 63, and then our brother Kellen Blewett is going to direct us in a prayer. Gentlemen, you have the lead on this, so let's here you go. All right, here we go. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised so shall I be saved from my enemies the Lord liveth and blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted the Lord liveth Blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord. And that's what we're going to do right now. Kellen, come on up. Uh, shall we pray? Dear Lord, thank you so much for this wonderful day, and thank you for allowing us to come together to worship your name. We pray that we may hold a service that's pleasing in your sight, and that John may be able to deliver a lesson that is pleasing in your sight. And we pray that we may be able to take what we learned and felt here today throughout our week to help us to live Christianly lives. Yeah, please help all those who are sick, hurt, or suffering or that could use your help. And thank you so much for all the blessings that you've given us. We pray for all these things in Christ Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Good job. Thank you, Kellen. Nicely done. I like the part where he said things we heard and felt. I like that. I feel good. You feel good? All right, let's listen to our hearts. Next song, number 810. How do you explain? How do you describe a love that goes from east to west and runs as deep as it is wide? You know all our hopes, Lord, you know all our fears, and words cannot express the love we feel, but we long for you to hear. So listen to our hearts hear our spirits sing a song of praise that flows from those you have redeemed we will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are but words are not enough to tell you of our love so listen to our hearts if words could fall like rain from these lips of mine and if I had a thousand years Lord I would still run out of time if you listen to my heart every beat will say thank you for the life 
Thank you for the truth and thank you for the way. So listen to our hearts, hear our spirit sing a song of praise that throws from those you have redeemed. That's us, folks. Let it go. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are. But words are not enough to tell you of our love. So listen to our hearts. Amen. Thank you all for joining in. Angry words, oh, let them never from the tongue unbridled slip. May the heart's best impulse ever check them ere they soil the lip. Love one another, thus saith the Savior. Children, obey the Father's blessed command love one another the saith the savior children obey the blessed command love is much to pure and holy friendship is to sacred far for a moment reckless folly thus to desolate and mar love one another the saith the savior children obey the father's blessed command love one another the saith the savior children obey blessed command let our words be sweetly spoken let kind thoughts be greatly stirred show our love to one another with abundance of kind words love one another <clears throat> savior children obey the father's blessed command Love one another, the saith the Savior. Children obey the blessed command. Just before this morning's lesson, we want to sing about the wonderful words of life. <clears throat> Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let them more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ, the blessed one, gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinnerless to the loving call, wonderful words of life. Also freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. 
Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Brother John, come and preach the word. Thank you, Stan. Good morning, family. Wow, what a beautiful, absolutely gorgeous day for Drive-In Church. We have just been so blessed lately, and I'm so grateful, Father, uh, for the Father in Heaven for providing us uh, just a wonderful way to worship underneath all the restrictions and lockdowns. We're able to gather together as a church. We're able to see each other's faces. We're able to visit a little bit after services and before. I miss the singing, I'm gonna tell you. I miss the singing. I miss hearing your voices and all of us in our four parts. I miss that. Amen. I look forward to that day. And so it's, uh, it's something that we do in lieu of and all things considered and uh, we're grateful for every gift given by God. Bill was, uh, was verbally abused by his wife continually. It just never seemed to stop and eventually the result of all of that was his complete destruction of his self-worth. And then his adolescent daughter, who had been growing up and observing how her mother spoke about her father, now copies that behavior, and Bill's bad situation doubles in intensity because now he has a wife and a daughter who belittle him. Nancy grows obese as revenge for a husband who chooses to never be home and even when he is home he's not really there with her and so her weight gain and her depression and her lack of libido eventually pushes her husband into the arms of another woman subconsciously this is what she wanted subconsciously this was her plan and after the divorce for scriptural reasons, she says, she returns to church. My question is, can the church help people like that? Can this congregation help heal people like Bill and Nancy? Yeah, they, they might need professional help, but listen to me now. Well, who they really need is Jesus. And Jesus designed his churches to be that trauma center for the soul where people with wounds and damage to their spirits can come and receive healing. We've looked at this series so far called The Flock That Rocked the World. We're looking at the church in the book of Acts chapter 2 and we notice that the earliest church was a saved church. They knew they were saved and they had the confidence therein. The earliest church was a studying church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine. And we see in Acts 2 and verse 42, they devoted themselves also to the fellowship. And that's what we're talking about again today. We've restored the true gospel of the early church. We're pretty proud of being a church that knows the true death, burial, and resurrection gospel. And we've restored the apostolic doctrine found in the New Testament. We believe and are completely convinced that Scripture alone has authority in religious matters today. But have we restored the spirit of the earliest church? Are we known as a fellowship of extreme love and encouragement 
Do those outside of our fellowship, do they look inside and do they see us possessing great spiritual love and encouragement? The church you find in Acts chapter 2 didn't need Hebrews 10.25 written to them. Hebrews 10.25 was not something that was relevant for this particular congregation. They didn't need to be asked how to consider to stir one another up in love and good works because they were filled with both. They didn't need to be asked to meet with one another and not neglect those assemblies because they were meeting daily and in the temple. And they didn't need to be asked to encourage one another because they were deeply involved in doing that. But I would say, in my own opinion, in today's world, most churches need t Hebrews 10.25. They need to be stirred up to love and good works. They need to neglect meeting together. They need to encourage one another. I would say that most churches today need encouragement, much, much more encouragement as part of their fellowship. The Turlock Church has been encouraging to me. It's one of the most loving congregations that I've ever served. Jesus has gifted me with a number of very precious people here. There are those in this congregation that have sensed my discouragement and my disappointment and my frustration. And they've been very good to sit down and talk with me and talk me through those moments. Really, no one has done that better than our elders. I love this eldership. And I don't say that because I'm a preacher speaking publicly and trying to get points. I'm saying that because these men know me. They know when I'm discouraged. They know when I'm frustrated. They know when I'm not good. And they're sensitive about that. And they've been used of God to help me through those periods where all I could think about was how things were not going as I thought they should. And I feel very blessed by their unique friendship what those elders have done and what several of you have done you call me on the phone you come by and you've used words God uses mature Christians to help struggling Christians with words so what's the Bible term for that? Bible term for that is encouragement. So what is that? What is the word encouragement mean? Well, it, it literally means to place courage inside someone who lacks it. In courage. It means to provide support and it means to help a person regain their confidence or instill hope in another who's lost it. The Greek word in the New Testament is often translated in different translations and passages as the word exhortation. Exhortation, that means urging someone to think and to live correctly. To have faith, to have hope, that's exhortation. And encouragement is how God helps his people to improve. It's how people learn to be stronger to be active when they're inactive to give when they're not giving to do when they're not doing encouragement is how God gets people to improve in Romans chapter 12 and verse 8 encouragement is listed as a spiritual gift in that passage it is listed as a one of the spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gives people and some people have that gift by the Spirit. Encouragement comes more easily to them, more naturally, I guess I could say supernaturally. But they look for opportunities to encourage others. They look for people who need encouragement. 
Now there are two other speaking gifts listed in the scripture that are Holy Spirit gifts given to Christians for all time. There is the gift of preaching, it's called prophecy in the Bible, but it's called, it's the gift of preaching, and there's the gift of teaching, and then again, the gift of encouragement. And with all speaking gifts, those gifts need to be honed. They need to be trained. They need to be um, perfected. Untrained members grow frustrated. They grow burned out. Untrained members can do a lot of damage. Ironically, trying to encourage someone and in actuality, because they don't know what they're doing or how to do it best, they can sometimes create deep scars in people's spirits at vulnerable times. And so just as if somebody has the gift of preaching, that preaching is better and glorifies God more as they develop that gift and hone that gift and uh, mature in that gift, so it is with the gift of encouragement. In Philippians chapter 2, we will see that encouragement is really an expression of love. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affliction and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves and let, look, let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. The best description that I've ever heard of, of, of encouragement is, encouragement is that skilled, spirit-led, Bible-filtered use of words. So let's talk about the power of a well-timed word. The words that you and I utter to another have tremendous power. Sometimes we're not even fully aware of how powerful our words can be. Verbal encouragement is far more than, hey, how you doing, or good to see you, or, oh, wow, you look nice in that outfit. Our words can oftentimes have no more sincerity or power as when you go to a, a checkout stand or a cashier and you're getting ready to purchase what you've shopped for and they always ask you the same question, don't they? Did you find everything you were coming to see? Did you find everything okay? Did you find what you're looking for? And you know what, every once in a while I say, no, I, I, had, I was looking for this. And they go, oh really? Okay, and they just keep going on. Which means to me that some guy in some corporate office somewhere felt like, you know what, if we, if we can just have our cashiers ask that questions of our customers, it'll be the, co the cornerstone of our customer service model. They're asking it, but they don't really mean it. Sometimes like when you're at the end of a flight, the stewardess says, okay, bye-bye, have a nice day, you know. Sometimes our words just don't have a lot of depth. And in congregations, when they gather together for assemblies and events, you'll hear a lot of talking and, and uh, laughter, which is one reason why we love doing it so much. Last Sunday was a great reminder of that. But the thing I'm talking about that changed the early church and changed the world is the fact that the people of the early church had times where they were able to speak privately about their frustrations and their fears to open up about their hurts and their doubts I don't think a congregation can claim to know the great healer without offering support and words for people who need it so much not careless cliches not shallow talk I'm talking about encouragement because people who don't receive from us that sort of healing that people who come and all they hear is that superficial surface talk I call it 
It's surface talk. How are you? How are you doing? Did you see the game last night? How's the weather? Wow, did you hear about? Did you see the headline? What do you think about? You know, it, that's there's nothing wrong with what I'm talking about. That's conversation. It happens on a larger scale when you're around a lot of people. That's the kind of conversation that happens at a table at a potluck. It's the kind of conversation that you have when you see, haven't seen people and there's a lot of them around and you have a conversation. That conversation is at a surface level and there's nothing wrong about that. But if that's all the church offers, if that's all the dialogue that a, a person gets when they come into a family of God and they come to a church of Christ and all they hear is that surface talk when they themselves are barely able to get out of bed because they're so depressed or they're so wounded by something that they've done or something that someone else has done and they're looking for someone to help them and they're coming to church and they're trying to worship and they're learning the Bible and they're seeking to pray to God and the reason why is because they're in such pain but if they come to a church and all they get is surface talk it's never going to be enough healing that we need most is deeper than that. The Bible is has plenty to say about words, the tongue. And one thing it says clearly is whatever has a potential for good has a potential for evil. I don't know if you've ever seen this verse, but in Proverbs 18, 21, it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. You can kill someone with your words, or you can resurrect someone with your words. In James chapter three, James goes into quite a bit of detail about warning about the tongue, it's chapter three. Beginning at verse 5, he says, So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze, ablaze by such a small fire. <laughs> 2020 in California knows that, doesn't it? And it says in verse 8, But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. We use it to bless our Lord and Father, and with it we use it to curse people who are made in the likeness of God. The same mouth that comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? No. Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or, or grapevine produce figs? Answer? No. Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water, and neither should a Christian's mouth be praising God and blessing God and also hurting people. A tongue can change the course of a person's life. It can start a fire that sometimes never quite goes out in a person's life. Larry Crabb is a Christian therapist and psychologist and I, I have a high regard for his work. He once shared in a seminar that I watched about a man who came to him who was in the depths of misery. He lost his family. He was losing his health and his business was failing. And as Dr. Crabb began to ask questions and to seek what the problem was, it became very clear. Shortly before this man's father died, the man who built the business from scratch, the man who built the factory and had become a very successful factory, shortly before he died, he looked at his son and he says, you're going to ruin this business and drive it into the ground. And that son worked himself tirelessly and toxically to prevent that prophecy that his father gave him and tragically and paradoxically because he was so fixated on preventing that prophecy he was actually helping it to come true and his business was failing and his family had it left him and his health is failing and the reason why is because he's got to make the business work words a handful of words from a father to a son it's possible just like Proverbs says to kill someone with your words 
Proverbs 12 and verse 18, the words of the reckless are like, they pierce like swords, it says, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. I'm ashamed to admit, I have thrust way too many swords into the souls of those in the church. You know me, you know I've got that quick wit, you know I like that banter. But sometimes I get in a pretty grumpy mood, pretty bad mood. I'm already in a bad way and somebody says something or I just take the opportunity and I just say something that just hurts someone. Just like that proverb says, piercing or thrusting with the sword. And I'm ashamed that I do that. I hate that I do that. And there are people that I was once close to that really don't want anything to do with me anymore because I did that. And I'm sorry that I've violated our friendship and our fellowship by just saying something oftentimes unplanned, something that I didn't premeditate. It just came out. And you know, you can't take it back. And many times, even if you apologize over and over, the wound doesn't go away because you're sorry. Because you're sorry you stuck a sword in someone's gut doesn't mean it doesn't need to heal. So it's no wonder that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, one of the most sobering warnings I can think of, in chapter 12 of Matthew and verse 36, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. And that's just what I was talking about. Those careless, thoughtless words that we didn't filter, we didn't hold back, we didn't season with grace. We will give an account for every careless word we speak. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. That's a pretty serious warning, don't you think? And I think Jesus was serious about that, very, very heavily serious about that, because it's such a prevalent problem. And he's asking his people, stop that tongue. How did James put it in chapter 1? Be slow to speak but on the positive side the, the tongue has the power to heal as well you can make a huge difference in someone's life a beautiful difference a, 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 a positive and godly difference in someone's life with your words when I was going to preaching school one of the guys in my class didn't grow up in the church. He converted in his early 20s. He was very excited about the Lord, very excited about the Bible, excited about church, excited about God, excited about salvation. And his enthusiasm was a real shot in the arm to his congregation that hadn't seen a lot of converts, especially those who had stayed in the church and, and were growing and were fired up and were excited and talking to other people and inviting people. And so they asked him one morning to lead a prayer at the table, the communion table. And he had never led a public prayer in his life. He'd never even spoken publicly in his life. He felt like God wanted him to do that because he was asked. So he got up there. But in his nervousness, he got everything wrong, he said. He mentioned how the Holy Spirit was crucified on the cross and that all his blood was spilled all over the ground. and. In any event, he got really flustered and he finished the prayer. And after the communion service was over and he passed the trays, he headed right out the back door. Because he realized what he had done. He realized what he had said in front of everybody and every, all part of it was wrong. And he felt terrible. And on his way to his car, he vowed, I will never say another public prayer in my life. Then he heard his name called and he turned around and one of the older elders of the church came up to him and listened to what he said. Son, whatever you decide to do for the Lord, I'm behind you 1,000%. 
That's what that young man needed to hear. And, uh, and God used that elder's words to get him there to the point to where the person I'm talking about went to preaching school, graduated, and as far as I know, still serving the church in that capacity 28 years later. One phrase, I'll never lead prayer in church again to standing before people and doing mission work in the world. Why? Because one godly man told him one godly thing that he desperately needed to hear. Yes, words can kill, but words can also give life. And if we would just suppress our opinions and suppress our criticisms and our negativity, if we will just suppress what comes naturally as an American citizen, complaining and griping about everything that we don't get our way, and if we will just shut up for a moment, then maybe the Holy Spirit can punch through that heart of ours and help us realize someone else needs a lift today. Not an opinion, not a purview, not even a, a philosophical point of view. What they need is to hear that Jesus wants to help them and can if they will just trust him more. God wants us to stimulate each other to love and good works. He wants us to look for ways to build each other up. And words are how that happens. After I converted, I was much like the friend that I talked about. I was very excited about church. I was leading people to the Lord. I was teaching Bible classes. I was leading prayers, doing devotionals, and things of that nature. And I kept continually hearing from the church that I was attending, you need to go to preaching school. And so I thought, I need to go to preaching school. And so I decided, I'll go to preaching school. But by the time I finally ended up attending preaching school, the last thing that I was ever going to be was a preacher in the Church of Christ. The church I was part of was very toxic, legalistic, could be incredibly opinionated and hard-hearted. Now, I still felt like I wanted to go to preaching school because I had a vast and huge hunger for the Word of God, and I needed to get out of that church anyway and learn the Bible more, and that's the reason why I went. So when I went to the Preston Road School of Preaching, my first opportunity to stand before my entire student body in chapel, my statement was this, I am not here to be a preacher in the Church of Christ. I will never have Church of Christ on my paycheck. That's what I said in 1984. I just wanted all those boys to know I'm not here to do that. And I didn't think I had any business doing that because the preacher that was in that church that I had left aged about 20 years and two. And I thought, man, there's no way I'm going to get in that grinder. I'll serve God. I'll go to school. When I graduate, I'll, I'll go and I'll, I'll get a career. And I'll, I'll develop into some secular professional of some sort. And then, you know, maybe I'll be an elder in 20 or 30 years, something like that. That was my idea. That's what I thought when I was in school. When I was a freshman, when I was a sophomore, when I was a junior, if you ask me, am I going to be a preacher when I graduate? No way. But in my final semester, One of my classmates, who by the way didn't have a very high opinion of me, at least I didn't think so, he pulled me aside privately and he said, John, I think you need to rethink not being a preacher. I've heard you preach for two years in this and I, I think you have a very powerful and a much needed message one that comes from someone who didn't grow up in the church and I think you need to rethink about not ever being a preacher and I want you to know family those words became a factor that influenced me that Seven weeks before I graduated, I went to the dean of the school and I told him, trembling, I think that maybe I'll try preaching.
I went to Becky before that and I said, "Hun, I'm, 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 I'm thinking about maybe trying to find a church when we graduate. She goes, I knew that. I'm behind you all the way. Let's do it. And I'm here today preaching to cars in a parking lot in Turlock, California in the year 2020 because Mike Harbour told me, I think you should be a preacher, John. And the dean said, yes, John, I'd love to see you go into full-time ministry. But greater than that was my wife who said, I'm behind you all the way, let's do it. Not a lot of words, but good words, amen. amen. Father God, Father God, thank you for your words. Help us with our words and use our words to give life to those we love. In Jesus' name, amen. Stan's going to lead us in a song, and then Brother Anglin's going to come and say the prayer for our communion. After that, we'll be closed. If you need the emblems, we have some up here in a basket. You can make your way up here while we sing this song. The song is designed to help us prepare our, our minds and our hearts to this memorial service that we're about to partake of. <clears throat> we don't sing this song too often here, but I was telling John the other day that one of our former members, Brother Don Lutzenberg, whenever we called on him to lead singing, he would lead this for communion. So it has a special meaning to some of us, especially. But it should have a special meaning to all of us when we think of the words involved. By Christ redeemed in Christ restored, we keep the supper of the Word and show the death of our dear Lord until He comes. His body given in our stead is seen in this memorial bread. And as we drink, we see the blood until He comes. And thus that dark betrayal night With the last advent we unite By one bright chain of loving right Until he Shall we pray? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you on this beautiful Lord's Day. And thank you for giving us this time to remember Christ's sacrifice on the cross that gives us the opportunity for eternal life. As we partake of this or break this bread, Heavenly Father, Help us to remember that it represents your body. Help our minds 
to go into the right place that we may, may partake, partake of this in a way that is pleasing to you. In Christ's holy name, amen. Shall we pray once again? Our most glorious Heavenly Father, as we remember Christ's sacrifice on the cross, the blood that He shed, the pain that He endured, that He could have walked away from but didn't, simply so we would have this opportunity for eternal life. It is a sacrifice that in no way, shape, or form are we worthy, and yet He did that for us. And truly, He asks so little in return, in comparison, as to how we should live our lives. Just remember the sacrifice that Christ made, the blood that was shed, that blood that protects us at all times. In Christ's holy name, amen. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, John, for a good lesson today, as always. And thank you all for being here and participating and enjoying one another's fellowship. I think it's just really terrific that we get to meet out here and we get to wave at each other and punch fists or whatever. At least it beats not seeing anybody. So it's really been good. Yeah. Amen.